I am excited to be able to share with you this morning. So take your Bibles, if you will. We'll get here in just a moment. Uh, but turn to James, not James, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. So this morning we begin a new series uh, entitled Biblical Worldview. And as, as you heard on the announcements and you've been hearing for the past few Sundays, we're hosting a Worldview conference this Saturday, 9 a.m. to noon. And if you can make it at all, I encourage you to come. Come for part of it. Come for all of it. It's free. Uh, but we're, we're going to be addressing some subjects and talking about things uh, related to sort of what we're talking about today and we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks in this series on uh, biblical worldview. So uh, we're at a very critical time, a critical uh, time in history for the church in America. And I'm going to be sharing some statistics with you this morning that, that reveals to us uh, that we are losing ground, that we, we've been silent and uh, our culture has experienced a significant shift towards secular, postmodern, humanistic worldview and set of values. According to the Pew Research Center, in the past 10 years, we've dropped from 77% to 65% of Americans who identify as Christian. From 77 to 65 of all Americans who identify as Christian. If you go back 20 years, that number was 85%. So we see a significant change happening all the time of just people in the United States that identify as Christians. So this morning, we're talking about having a, a biblical worldview. And you may be asking, what is, what is a biblical worldview and why is that important? Well, a person's worldview is important because it shapes how they make sense of and participate in the world around them. So a worldview is the intellectual, moral, emotional, spiritual filter through which a person sees and responds to the world. George Barna says it's like the operating system of a computer. So a biblical worldview is based on the truth claims and principles from the Bible. And so, so to speak, we're looking at the world around us through the lens of the Bible, through the lens of the scripture. So America was founded on, on, biblic, on a biblical worldview principle that, uh, and that was kind of pre the prevailing thing in the United States through the 20th century. But in 1990, since 1990, we've had a predominant worldview in America that has been postmodern and secular that opposes biblical truth. So we're seeing a major shift and it's something that we want to address and that we want to bring to our attention, that we want to put it on in, into our minds and, and get it into our hearts that, you know, what we have going on here is we're called to be salt and light as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We're to influence the world around us, but, but when you look at the statistics that we see going on, I think the church is being more affected by the culture than the church affecting the culture around us. So what do we do and how do we, how do we deal with this? Well, there was a study done this year in March of 2020 by the Cultural Research Center, Arizona Christian University, led by George Barna, and they found that only 6% of Americans possess a biblical worldview. 6% of Americans, which is a 50% decrease from 25 years ago. So we're seeing significant differences. Now listen to this, 21% of people who attend a Protestant evangelical church have a biblical worldview, only one out of five. When we talk about Pentecostal churches, only 16% of people who attend Pentecostal churches have a biblical worldview. 1% of Catholics, have a biblical worldview. When it comes to age, 9% of those 50 year and older, 50 and older, only 9% have a biblical worldview. For those in their 30s and 40s, only 5% have a biblical worldview, and 18, ages 18 to 29, 2%. 2% of our people in America have that biblical worldview. George Barnes suggests that a person's worldview starts around the age of 15 to 18 months, and it's pretty well set by the time they're 13 with a few uh, tweaks and um, uh, you know, some adjustments there through the teenage years into their 20s. So children are critically important in this idea of transmitting and transferring of biblical worldview, now more than ever. Our job, our responsibility, it's vital for us to teach, to train, and to equip all ages, but especially our children and our teens. But we're looking at all ages, no matter what age you are, to have that biblical foundation of biblical principles. And you've heard us talk 
a lot about our personal responsibility as parents and as grandparents to train up our children, to instruct them in the ways of the Lord according to Ephesians 6, 4. And as parents and as grandparents, we need to make sure that we ourselves are following God with all of our heart, that we're committing ourselves to wholeheartedly following him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, that we're pursuing him that we are pursuing his plans, his purposes, his principles for our lives that are laid out in scripture. And that by doing so, we can purposefully, purposefully model and transfer a biblical worldview, a biblical foundation to our children and grandchildren. There's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of overwhelming numbers there. But I hope that you get the idea here that we've lost a lot of ground in America. And it's showing in a lot of different ways. So I want to change gears here just a little bit and ask, how many of you are good with directions? So if I asked you how, give me some directions on how to get to St. Louis. How many of you could do that for me? Thankfully, we have Google Maps, and I, I just happened to pull this up yesterday. Google Maps, uh, I, I thought, uh, how, to, how to get to Kansas City. Well, that's just a pretty much a straight shot. But I know that it's not, is that, not that easy to get to St. Louis from Des Moines. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can go to get there. And I pulled it up on Google Maps, and it gave me three options. But the three options that you get on, on Google Maps, you're going to get the shortest route, you're going to get the quickest route, and then you're going to get a route that has uh, maybe a little bit of a scenic route. And I know just looking at that map, I would, I would probably choose one or two other ways, and I don't know what the, the best way is, but it might be different based on, you know, your situation. Do I want to get there quicker? Do I want to do less miles? There's a lot of different factors uh, involved in that. But let me ask you another question. How do you get to heaven? How can we as people, Americans, people in general, God's creation, how can we we be admitted into God's eternal home? And just as I could probably get a lot of different ideas for directions on how to get to St. Louis, I guarantee you there's a lot of ideas on how people have in mind for us to get to heaven. A lot of different answers. Are you in John chapter 14? got your hard copy uh, volume here or on your, on your electronic device, or you can read along on the screen. John chapter 14, a, a familiar passage of scripture. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He's getting ready. He knows his time is short. It's coming close when he is going to uh, face some very difficult things, and he's going he's gonna to lose his life, and he's going to go to heaven. He's going to overcome death, hell, and the grave. But here's what he speaks to uh, his disciples. He tells them, first of all, he says, do not Let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. Most likely your version says there's, in my father's house are many rooms or many mansions. And he says, if if that were, were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. So Jesus is talking about this eternal home. And he's saying, look, I, I've got a place, I've got all kinds of room, and I've got a place just for you. And he says, you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, the guy who was doubting Thomas, the one who said, I'm not going to believe that Jesus rose from the dead until I can put my finger in the place in his hands where the nails were. This is Thomas. He says, Lord, we don't know. We don't know. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus responds by saying, I am the way and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus makes a bold statement here, wouldn't you agree? It's a bold statement when, when, when Thomas says, how do we know the way? Because we don't know where you're going. And Jesus said, I am the way. Me. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. It's just an extremely hard statement for some people to swallow. You see, a lot of people think that Jesus' statement about being the way, they say that that, that sounds a little arrogant, it sounds a little narrow-minded and exclusive. There's only one way? You see, Jesus' statement wasn't politically correct when he said it, and it's really not very politically correct today. So what makes Jesus' statement about being the way? I am the way, the truth, and the life. What makes that so controversial? These people today have all kinds of misconceptions about God and faith and Christianity. 
Those um, 65% of people that I told you about that identify uh, as Christians in the United States, imagine this. What if those people were to really, truly live out their faith? I know that this world would be a different place. An interesting fact about that 65% of people in the United States that identify as Christians, 56% of those people, of those 65% here in the United States that identify as Christian, admit to the fact that they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So of those people that have a biblical worldview, it's one-tenth of one percent of those 56% of people that actually have a biblical worldview, yet they identify as a Christian. They've got a lot of different ideas. So we've been sharing statistics the past few weeks about this Barna study that was done in 2009, and just a couple that we've, that we've talked about that apply to what we're talking about today. Only 62% of born-again Christians believe that Jesus was sinless. Just a little more than half of, of people who are Christians, who identify as Christians, uh, that these are born-again Christians, believe that Jesus was sinless, and only 47% agree that it's impossible to earn your way to heaven. That means 53% of born-again Christians believe that you can earn your way to heaven. What do you do about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that says, it is by grace that we are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a free gift of God, not of works so that no one will boast, right? So where do we get these views and how does this, how does this kind of stuff happen? Another study says that 65% of millennials, those who are 18 to 29 in the U.S., regular, who regularly attend a church, think that being a good person is the way you get to heaven. These are Christian millennial young people. A lot of misconceptions. But the reality is the Bible isn't... Uh, isn't, isn't unclear about the issue of salvation. Here's, here's just a few verses. Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Pretty straightforward. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. So we can talk about how Christianity is just so narrow-minded and so exclusive, but the reality is we've just, read, we've just read several terms here that talk about it's open to everyone. Whoever believes in him. It's just that Jesus is the way to believe. He's the one. John 17, 3, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one who you sent to earth. And Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So as your pastor, as, as a pastoral staff, we wanna think that we have a church that, that, that believes the truth about Jesus being the only way. But if we're looking at statistics, it tells us that we got all kinds of views in the room. Do we believe that Jesus is the perfect sinless son of God? That Jesus was born to a virgin, he lived a sinless life, he was crucified and died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried in a tomb and three days later he rose from the dead, that Jesus ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God making intercession for us, that one day Jesus will return for his people, the dead in Christ will rise first and all who re will remain will be caught up together to meet him in the air and forever will be with the Lord. Do you believe those things? Yes. Some of you do. <laughs> Was that the 20 some percent Austin? Is that what? <laughs> I hope that we all believe that because that's the truth. And if we believe the scripture, and you're here today for a reason, on some level, some way, you are a follower of Jesus, or you're interested, and you're here, and we want to tell you the truth. We don't want to mislead you. But all of that is in the book. I just read, it's on my printed page, but it came from the book. And I understand this is God's, God's word about himself to us, but he did all of that for you. If there was multiple ways to God, which is kind of a prevailing idea attitude in our culture, why in the world would Jesus send his son to die on a cross to be crucified? 
If, he could, if we could get there some other way, that would be cruel. Stupid. There's one way, and that way is Jesus. So what do you really believe about Jesus? What do you believe about the Bible? How does what you believe affect the way that you live? Jesus put it like this in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What he's saying is that not all the, not all the people around who sound religious are really godly. You know, we can play the part, we can look religious, we can sound religious, we can do religious things, but it doesn't make us godly. Jesus said, they may refer to me as Lord, but they still won't enter the kingdom of heaven. The decisive issue is whether they truly believe and obey God. That's the way. Jesus is the way, he's the only way. So what, is, what does the world say about Jesus? What's the popular cultural belief uh, about religion in our world? And I wanna just talk real briefly this morning about three myths about, about that, about Jesus, about religion. So I want you to think for a minute, in the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, was given directions of how to get to Oz. What was that, what was the direction she was given? Oh, you guys know. What if Dorothy said, you know, I don't really wanna follow the yellow brick road. You got a blue road, red road, green road. There was one way to get to Oz and all she had to do was find the yellow brick road and get on the yellow brick road and it would take her to Oz. What's different than Jesus is the way. Just find Jesus and he will lead you the way that you need to go. But that's the view of our culture is you just pick whatever road you want and thinking that that road, whatever that road is, I'm gonna get on this road and expect to end up here, not knowing exactly where it will go. The popular view in our culture is that regardless of what spiritual path you take, all roads will lead to the same top of the same mountain. All religions are just different ways to get to God. But Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way, I am one of many ways. He said, I am the way. And with one statement, Jesus puts Christianity in a class all by itself. It sets it apart from every other religion, from every other group of people. The uniqueness of the Christian faith is based on the uniqueness of Jesus. You think about other, other religious leaders who say, follow me and I'll show you the way to salvation. And Jesus said, I am the way. Other leaders may say, I, I follow me and I'll, I'll show you the truth. Jesus said, I am truth. I am the truth. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am, I am, I am. I am the way. Follow me. Pretty simple, pretty plain. Why do we have such a problem with that? Either Jesus was out of touch with the reality or he knew something that we needed to know. So the difference between Christianity and every other religion is Jesus. It's Jesus. Other religions, other religions, their beliefs are based on man's attempt to reach God. If you meet certain requirements, if you give enough to the poor, if you pray your daily prayers in the right way, if you make a pilgrimage to the holy city, if you eat the right foods, whatever it is, it's trying to earn God's favor. And if you do that and you're successful, then you will be saved. But Christianity is about God reaching out to man through his son, Jesus Christ. It's not what we can do for ourselves, but what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus died in our place. He died for you. He took your place on the cross. It's about what he has done for us. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. There's not multiple ways to God, only Jesus, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Proverbs 16, 25 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end leads to death. Jesus said, I am the way. You can't earn your way to heaven. Other religions claim that you can know the way to God by, by those types of things, but it's only Jesus that can bring us into God's presence. So myth one is that all religions lead to God. Myth number two, all religions te teach truth. Ask yourself this question, what is truth? 
And who is to say what truth is? A lot of people say truth is relative. Who are you to say that your truth is the truth and my, my truth is, is, your truth is better than my truth? You have your truth, I have my truth. And there absolutely is no absolute truth, which is ludicrous because that's an absolute statement. It takes an absolute statement to say there's absolutely no absolute truth. Absolute truth is something that's true no matter what time you live in, no matter what culture you're at, no matter all of that. It's just true. Try talking to you if you're a student. Try talking to your teacher when you get a math problem wrong and you go and say, well, that's your truth. (laughs) Talk to your English teacher and you just say, well, I, I just have a different perspective on the use of the English language. Probably not gonna get you the grade. What if you went to your science teacher and said, I I know that I can make water out of chlorine, bleach, and baking soda. Here's the thing, you can make whatever truth claim that you want to, but you've got to back it up. Back up the truth. You should be ready to back it up. By definition, truth should be observable. It should be able to be demonstrated so that others can know the truth. So Jesus did more than claim to know the truth. He said, I am the truth. If Jesus is the truth, then, then, then what Jesus said must be true, right? If he says I'm the truth, then what he says should be true. If Jesus is truth, let's see if he can back up what he's saying about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. If you're taking notes, it's not going to be on the screen. Jesus took the 12, his disciples, he took them aside and he told them. This is what he said, Luke 18, 31. We are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He's referring to the Old Testament. There are 351 prophecies about Messiah in the Old Testament concerning Messiah that was to come. Written hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on earth. And this is what he goes on to enumerate. He says, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. That's what the Old Testament prophecies say about Jesus. 351 total, and Jesus is getting ready to back up what he's saying about I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So before Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he tells his disciples what's gonna happen to him. Okay, so it's one thing to say I'm gonna die. It's one thing to stage your, your, your own death. It's another thing to say that you're gonna rise from the dead. How are you gonna pull that one off? So throughout the Old Testament, we have these prophetic statements about the Messiah. And Jesus said to his disciples, everything written by the prophets about me will be fulfilled when we go to Jerusalem. It's nearly a mathematical impossibility for all of those prophecies written about the Messiah to have happened. And unless Jesus is really the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, it can't happen. Maybe you've kind of understood and seen this before, but the Old Testament, hundreds of years written before Jesus was born, like I said, 351 prophecies or, or somewhere about there about the Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled them all through his life, death, and resurrection. What are the odds that one person could fulfill all 351? Let me, let me give you an idea. Just one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies is that number right there. And I don't know if you can read that, I had to figure that out, but we've got the hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillion. One in 100 quadrillion, it's one to the uh, 10 to the 17th power. That's just fulfilling eight in one person. If we, if we move that up to, uh, what if one person fulfilled 40 of those prophecies? There's the number, 10 to the 157th power. That's 157 zero, I can't count that high. I, if, if, if there's a math guy around here or a math person that can tell me what that number is, yeah, more power to us. It, the point is this, that's just 40. And Jesus fulfilled all 351. So when Jesus said he was the truth, The events of his life prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus is who he said he is. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The third myth is that all religions are equal and basically what we've talked about on the other two make this one kind of false too. 
You see, Christianity believes that God reconciled creation to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Both Christianity and Judaism believe that there's one eternal God who is the creator of heaven and earth. But Judaism doesn't recognize Jesus as the son of God, the Messiah, the savior of the world. They, they both can't be right. And like Christianity and Judaism, Islam is a monotheistic uh, religion believing in only one God. But Islam denies that Jesus was the Son of God, rejects, rejects his death on the cross for our sins. We got Hinduism who believes everything. Everything's a God. So how can they both be right? They can't. Either Jesus, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, either he meant it and he, could, he fulfilled it or he didn't. And he proved it by what he did, that he is the way. I know that there's a lot of information here and I probably overwhelmed you with a lot of numbers, but here's the the point, the point in, in all of this. Jesus is the way, he's the only way. No matter what you think, no matter what somebody else tells you, and here's the thing, you can believe that Jesus is the way, that might make you religious. And religious people, Jesus said, a lot of people say, Lord, Lord, but aren't gonna be in heaven. Do we truly believe in him and do we live a life of obedience toward that? We're living in a culture, in a world where those kind of values, we just, we, we are so wrapped up in ourselves, and we're so involved in ourselves. I think we've lost our way and it showed just the effects in the church. What's going on here? I'm reminded of a story in John chapter six Wherever Jesus went when he was teaching here on earth, he drew a crowd. In John chapter six, the first few verses, you see twice that there was a great crowd, a huge crowd that that gathered with him. In verse two, he goes up into a mountain. They've climbed the mountain with him. And that's where Jesus feeds the 5,000. They're looking for miracles. They were saying, Jesus, do miracles for us. Jesus finally addresses them at one point. He says, look, all you care about is food. You just want me to feed you. You just want me to feed you physical food. You just want me to do a show for you. And he begins to kind of lay it down by saying, look, it's, I've, I've done all these things. He, he even claims to say, he says, I'm the bread of life. Look, if you, if you follow me and you give all of your heart to me, you'll never thirst again. You'll never be hungry again. And what he's saying is, I can provide everything for you. But he began to lay out that it's going to cost them something. They're going to have to be obedient. You have to be all in on this thing. And it's a really a sad story because it says that they all they all left because it was too hard, too hard to understand, too hard to know, what, what, how am I going to do that? I've got a life. And Jesus says that Jesus turned to his 12 disciples and he said to them, so what about you guys? Are you leaving me too? Just down to the original 12. And Peter says, Lord, where, where would we go? Who are we going to go to? Because you are the one who has the word of life. It was Peter who said, early on, Jesus, you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If we truly believe that Jesus is the way, he's the only way, then why are we living full of all kinds of other pursuits? It's time for us as a church to be all in with Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? This morning as I'm talking and and just sharing, I know that there's people sitting in the room today and you're saying, look, I... I haven't been living for Jesus. Intellectually, I know that he's the way, but I haven't been living that way. I realize that I'm lost without Jesus, and today I am making a decision to give my life to Jesus. And as every head's bowed and your eyes are closed, if that's you and you say, Pastor Jeff, I'm giving my life to Jesus, I realize that he is the way. He's the only way. And the only way that I can receive what he has for me and how I'm going to make it in this world is to follow him. The Holy Spirit is drawing you. If that's you this morning and you're saying, Pastor Jeff, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I'm going to make him the way that I'm going to pursue. If that's you, would you just raise your hand across the room? Raise your hand, keep it raised. Anyone else? Thank you. So how about, how about the, the rest of us in the room? Are we just intellectual followers of, of Jesus? 
we just come and take a place in the pew and do our, do our church thing, our Christian thing? Or do we really truly believe who Jesus said that he is? And we're going to live that way and we're going to follow him, that we're all in. It's not going to be said of me what Jesus said. You call me Lord, Lord, but yeah, you're not, you have no place in my kingdom. I want to be all in. If that's you this morning and you're saying, look, I am going all in. That today from this day forward, I'm not just going to live a, a, a Christian life by word only. See, the reality is if we really, truly give our lives to Jesus and we let his love and his life and all that he is be inside of us, if we're in the word and we're growing in a relationship with him, then we should be able to go out these doors and not even try. We're so full of the spirit, we're so full of his presence because we spend time with him. I go back to Peter uh, in, in Acts. They healed somebody and then they got put in jail for it and they, they were brought before the leaders and, and it says that they took note of these guys, Peter. They had been with the Lord. Do you want that to be said of you? That your life so reflects the love, the life, the light of Jesus. That wherever you go, whatever, you be, and it comes from being all in. I've decided to follow Jesus. Whether nobody else in this room follows, you'd say, I'm going to follow. And today, from this day forward, it's going to be different for me. I'm going all in for Jesus. If that's you, would you just stand where you're at? Jesus, we don't, we don't want to be part of the crowd. You died for each one of us individually, not just for this church collectively. And there's not one in this room that I am comfortable with not making it to heaven. And we've established today, and your word has established it long ago, that Jesus, you are the way. You are the only way. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. We believe you. We trust in you. We're going to obey you. We're going to move forward. And we're going to believe, God, that you're going to do something in our lives, in our church, in our community, and in our world to pour uh, your spirit out wherever we go, that you would work in us and work through us, that we could recapture what we've lost in our homes, with our children, with our grandchildren, in our communities, in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, that we would be the salt and the light of Jesus wherever we go. We want to go all in. And Jesus, we're not just saying it with our lips, but we believe it with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. We want to love you, God, with everything that we have. As a church, would you pour your spirit out on us and move through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. But the foundation that's already been laid, Paul said, and that is Jesus Christ. Whatever we build on any other foundation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall. The writer of Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, what makes sense to you, what makes sense to the crowd, what makes sense to those people. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge Him in all your ways. He'll make your, your path straight. There is a narrow path that leads to God. It might feel exclusive, it might seem narrow-minded, but listen, it's just Jesus. He's the way. Let's walk in that. Let's trust him with all of our heart. So your mission today, when you walk out of these doors, in the auditorium, when the mask on service, you walk out of those doors. If you're joining us online, when you walk out the door of your home, you're on mission. Let's so live a life filled with the spirit and with his power that we can go on mission wherever we go. And we don't even have to try, Jerry. It's good to try, but we don't have to try. It just kind of happens. I'm saying that because he does that all the time. 
let all of us be on mission to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to affect somebody's life. I'm going to take the love, the light, the, the life of Jesus wherever I go. Father, I just pray for your people and our church, God, that you would pour your spirit out on us. God, that this week you would do incredible, amazing things, drawing us near to you. May we draw near to you and that we have the promise that you will draw near to us. Jesus, you are the way, the only way. Thank you that you love us so much that you took our place to make a way for us to have eternal life. Bless your people. We go with your spirit and with your power. In Jesus' name, amen.